Did you all enjoy the break? Yeah, lots of controversial stuff to talk about, I'm sure. Uh, let's see if we can level it up uh, with the next panel. I have high hopes on this panel, very high hopes. Um, okay, and um, before I introduce our panelists, uh, we'll do something sneaky again, which is, I'll introduce, okay, I'll introduce the topic. The topic of this panel is AI DAOs, brain computer interfaces, and lunar governance, okay? All right, so again, we are bridging divides here. Uh, but first, a show of hand from every one of you, please. So first question, who here thinks that AI will be the make or break technology in 10 to 30 years? Hands up. The make or break technology, the almost the number one thing that will matter in 30 years time, AI. Okay. Then who here thinks that crypto commerce technology, such as AI DAOs, could be a good strategy for cooperating with artificial intelligences? Who here thinks that crypto is something to say on the problem of AI safety? Okay, yeah, likewise. Okay, who here thinks that brain computer interfaces, so leveling humans up to artificial intelligences, could have something to say on the topic of AI safety and cooperating safely with AIs. Okay, very nice. And who'd be interested in trying a BCI anyway? Just because of shits and giggles. <laughs> okay, and then last one. Who here thinks, uh, well, I think we all think that, uh, I think lunar settlement is kind of exciting, um, but who here thinks that the types of governance systems that we set up on the moon should broadly resemble those that we have here on Earth. Okay, number one. We have one person. Okay, number two. Who here thinks that uh, the moon is a really nice blank slate on which we can prototype entirely novel things? And who here thinks we should do something in between? Learn from our mistakes? Yeah, just a few, maybe not learn from them. Okay, well, I'm hoping, I was hoping to see my hands up. Jesse, you have some work to do. Okay, well, great. So with that said, I can introduce our panel. Uh, so first one up, uh, we have Trent McConaughey. Trent, thank you so much for uh, accepting to come on such short notice. I discovered you writing much, much more. Oh, first of all, I should say um, you were spearheading or at least decentralizing the process of Ocean Protocol which is um, the data common C that many projects, such as VitaDAO, I think as well, uh, draw from uh, as they're expanding out the uh, crypto commerce space. Also, you have an insane blog uh, in the best way possible on which you cover everything from AI DAOs uh, to um, spaceships and tokens, which is writing that you do on the very long-term goals of humanity and how we can achieve them uh, and crowdfund them. Second one up, um, we have, what's the name of the blog? Trend. Uh, at Trend yeah, we will send, yeah, we are sending everything, all the follow-up materials and the follow-up email tomorrow. So please make sure to open that. Second number, we have Peter. Uh, Peter Schlecht is from BrainGrade and Peter is working on making humans smarter. So basically leveling up our output to our input and, and making sure that we can uh, keep up with AI as we, uh, as we go along. There's lots of really exciting work happening right now in brain-computer interfaces, which I think you'll talk a little bit more on. But very, very interesting topic. And finally, we have Jesse Cade. Jesse Cade is from the Open Lunar Foundation, and they are really working on pretty hard uh, in a very exceptional time on peaceful, cooperative uh, lunar governance. And I think it is a, kind of an exciting and a pretty unique time to be doing this because many efforts are currently gearing up to that. We are also housemates, so whenever I meet her in the kitchen in San Francisco, and I ask her what she's currently working on, I have my mind continues to be blown. And I wonder why not everyone is uh, kind of like, lets everyone uh, fall to the, lets everything fall to the ground and is like heading into that space because it is a unique time to be thinking about this. Okay, well, um, I think I've, I've said enough. Now I want to hear from you guys. Maybe we start with you first, uh, Trent, because um, yeah, let's start with the topic of AI DAOs first. So what are AI DAOs? Uh, why are they interesting? How are they different from current DAOs? And why may we in a few years, or let's say a few tens of years, 
not know anymore whether we'll be cooperating with a human uh, or an AI. Uh, sure. So um, uh, thank you, by the way, for having me here. And every thank you, everyone, for um, what looks like your attention. So thank you. Um, uh, AI DAOs are basically AIs that own themselves or DAOs infused heavily with AI. So, um, you know, take one example, think like Bitcoin, but in the algorithm in the center of Bitcoin, rather than just a very dumb thing that doles out Bitcoins every 10 minutes, it's a bit smarter where it's got some AI intelligence, maybe building a world model, updating itself over time. That's one example. Another example is imagine Bitcoin again, but instead of all, a bunch of humans running miners all around, every, every single agent that interacts with that center centralized um logically centralized entity of bitcoin every single agent around it is is an ai right um so it's really a machine to machine economy that way and then to generalize instead of you know ai at the center or ai at the edges um just imagine you have a whole bunch of ai agents running around running around and each one of them has its own wallet and it owns itself and it can generate its own art sell its own nfts all of that right um you know how you can eat pretty readily then have the world's first ai millionaire world's first ai billionaire all that right so that's kind of the ways you can come at AI DAOs. Um, and, you know, this is actually starting to happen. There are more and more um, AI-infused uh, blockchain technologies out there happening, right? So, so that's a baseline of how to think about this. It's not science fiction. It's stuff that is buildable with technology today. Um, but what's quite interesting is, um, you know, if you extrapolate this, um, you can pretty readily get at worries about things like the paperclip maximizer and stuff. But no worries, we actually already have a paperclip maximizer. It's called Bitcoin. It's eating the energy of the planet. So we don't have to wait for AI DAOs for that one. Yay. Um, but anyway, good thing other blockchains aren't eating the energy. I'll, I'll, I'll stop on that. But so at the macro level, why AI DAOs? Why is this interesting? And um, to me, I like to approach it from a perspective of um, what are some of the big macro problems that humanity is facing? One is, you know, I spent 20 years in AI research, including working on, well, on many forms of AI, et cetera. And, um, I see that actually AI is eating um, the jobs one at a time, all the, and eventually we're going to end up with you know no jobs left for humans, um, and that might seem crazy. You'll say, okay, well you know I can be creative, you know, and that's human, right? And the answer is no. Like I know I did my PhD on creative AI, doing stuff that only humans could previously do. Everyone thinks they're special. Guess what? AIs and computing can do this pretty well. You know, oh well, only uh, humans have empathy. No, not really. In fact, robots in Japan. Um, according to the studies, have more empathy than the, the human nurses, right? So we have to get past our carbon cells, right? Carbon is not a deity, all that too. And, um, but it's worrisome, right? Because we all want to um, feed ourselves. We all want to self-actualize all of that. And so, um, you know, one idea is UBI, all of this. Um, but how do you pay for that? So there's two problems, right? AI taking all the jobs in one side. And on the opposite side, you know, this goal of UBI and all of this, how do you solve that? And at the same time, you know, we're heating up our planet to make it super, you know, hot and we're worried about cataclysmic um, failures, et cetera. How do you solve all this? And there's one interesting thing that we can do, which is basically um, have the philosophy of nature. Think like a tree. A tree owns itself um, and it takes in um, air. I mean, sorry, carbon dioxide and, and um, moisture and manufactures wood and oxygen. Right. And it just does. And it's not just trees, it's forests and, and the wind and the soil and all of this. Nature, Mother Earth, right? Um, this cradle of civilization. So why can't we layer on silicon and steel and AI and all this to basically extend that in a way where um, it's equal, it maintains equal opportunity the same way that Nature 1.0 does, but um, generalize this where you know, we have um, public utility networks um, that are benevolent and, and um, self-driving cars um, that run around and take us where we need and help basically extend this cradle of civilization um, but with um, t uh, silicon and steel and so on, right? And, you know, I, I called this Nature 2.0. There's now a movement called Sovereign Nature Initiative, which is run with it, and I think it's amazing. Um, and so with that, um, ultimately, imagine each of these, you know, self-driving cars running around. Why can't it take all of its surplus and feed that into UBI, right? Why can't you have self-owning forests like we have in, here in Berlin with the Terra Zero project experimenting, et cetera? Why can't some of these forests not only take care of themselves, but, you know, give back to help uh, humans uh, nurture themselves and, and stuff too. So over time, basically, you have enough income for people to take care of themselves, not just basic, but even self-actualization income. So in the end, um, you can have, um, basically take the ideas, uh, the technology substrates of AIs and DAOs and extend it, run with it, to basically go back to a lot of what many of us yearn for, the sort of natural state where it's more equal opportunity and sort of a one and um, chase you know, self-actualization. Um, while being able to feed our families. So that's in a nutshell what I usually take one hour to talk about. 
That's why it's book extra fast. Um, and but to unpack it to sol to summarize is um, you know AI DAO technology is here today. Um, you know AI is on blockchain. Blockchain is helping AI, etc. But you can extend this, extend this to basically help to address issues. Um, you know existential questions for humanity around AI's. You know waking up and taking all our jobs around helping with climate, around many other issues. So it, it can be a very nice tool. It's not a panacea, but it's a nice tool that can help all of us. So um, that's what gets me up in, in the day. Uh, you know, Ocean is a piece of that. It's, it's sort of one step in this big, long technology tree uh, of the things you need. And part of it, you need a really great data access control system. That's a public utility network for the world. So that's what we're doing right now with Ocean. But make no mistake, um, you know, as that stabilizes, there's going to be more and more AI DAOs that will come. So, and we'll so, come to your very, very long-term future vision in just a sec yes. that I think really uh, draws on both of what we we're talking about just now. But to just lay the lay the groundwork a little bit, uh, maybe you can you know just riff on that and talk a little bit about what it means to be human right now, where humans are bottlenecked, and where brain-computer interfaces can help us uh, get a little bit, um, yeah, space space to the top. I don't know what it is to be human right now. So I think that has to answer everyone for themselves. Um, unfortunately, I cannot help there, but I can talk about what louder now, way better, what VCI can do for you and how it can help you. So the most amazing things what you see today with brain computer interfaces is that it helps patients. So kind of move limbs again, what they couldn't move before, or they can speak again when they couldn't speak before. But it's even more interesting what it can do in the future. And it's, you can see it about kind of what superpowers you would love to have with your most important tool. What is obviously, I mean, you know, the punchline is your brain. And there are two things. You can super fast download information, so super fast writing, or you can super fast upload information, means super fast reading. And both is possible and both is getting done today and will be way more powerful in, in the future for that. Regarding kind of how it protects us versus AI, as I believe, um, but Trent is the more an expert than I am, is that AI's only boundaries is the amount of energy um, it can consume to grow and to get better. Um, it probably wouldn't even help if we extend our brain exponentially. But when we think about kind of what the bottom line is, our brain made the last major leap 80,000 years ago. 80,000? 6,000 years ago, we invented the wheel. So the people at this time had the same brain as I have, as we all have. And we are updating everything all the time and make it better and better. And now think about what it would mean when we make this leap of kind of getting so much faster and reading so much more and not sitting like 15 years in school to get all this information. And I can give you the whole information what I want to tell you now just in an instant. Think about that. What would it be kind of when this is way, way faster? Yeah. When we have finally a person kind of getting to an IQ of 200 or 300 or 400. But be aware when we talk about IQ, what's a difficult term by itself. So when we talk about enhancement of the brain, it's we are mainly talking about kind of uploading information, helping people, helping sick people. So we by ourselves, we are developing a brain implant for Alzheimer patients. So to save their memories because you're a combination of your memories right now. And so helping there, we can also increase the bottom line. Doesn't matter. Thank you. It's not in your brain yet. <laughs> it's not in my brain. Yeah, I have to write it down. So this is what we are talking about today. It's a really basic help and kind of going over this big wall that's unfortunately still awaits all of us at the end and towards the end of our life. What end? We just... We're here for the last panel. Well, I think the next Foresight event will be done um, by sub-vocalization only, and we won't need microphones anymore. Um, okay, next one up, uh, Jessica. Um, let's see if we can continue the streak. So thinking about um, the challenges that we have um, ahead, um, not only on Earth, but you know, as we also move out 
uh, into space uh, gradually. Uh, what do you think are challenges that will be quite similar to the current ones that we're facing and which are quite different? I think that, you know, we a little bit discussed and, and you're really actively like quite, I think, you know, working on it uh, quite down to earth, uh, if I might say, on the problem of like, what do property rights mean in space? So which challenges will be different? Which challenges will be similar as uh, we, um, we settle the moon and um, what is Open Lunar doing in that space? Yeah, so I guess, first of all, I, I, I guess it's helpful to acknowledge that we've been talking about the fact that, you know, space settlement is coming now for maybe a few decades. And so there's always this question of, is it really happening now? And if so, why? And, um, may, you know, maybe it's just going to be another 50 or 100 years. Uh, and I guess, honestly, we don't know for sure. But what we do see happening is that uh, launch costs are coming down massively. So if anybody read like Gerard O'Neill's The High Frontier, if you look at the, co the launch costs that he quotes, uh, in that book as enabling some of the major um, sort of like settlement visions that he lays out. Uh, SpaceX is now coming down to that price with the launches that they're offering and, and other small launch companies as well. Obviously, technology miniat miniaturization, a bunch of other trends that we're all familiar with. I mean, that that the um, sort of narratives that we've talked about in history are really converging on a, on a potential. And, you know, what we do with that potential is up to us. But um, we are seeing that there's there are a number of private companies not just American companies, but international companies that are that have credible plans to go to the lunar surface and um, mostly, uh, I mean, robotically, not with humans, uh, as well as a number of different uh, nation states. And what that raises is the question of how they'll coordinate once they get there. Um, we have a limited governance regime in outer space. Um, the and the, the baseline uh, for uh, for sort of forming shared agreements um, is something called the Outer Space Treaty that that kind of like subtracts certain core elements of how we built the international system today and how we tend to, uh, in, the, in the traditional state system, how we uh, build property rights. And so that's one of the like core elements that's going to be different when we go to the moon is that we don't have, we don't have state sovereignty in outer space. It's, it's what's called an area beyond national jurisdiction. And so without state sovereignty, the question of how you would register property rights um, is, is um, sort of constellated and we end up uh, having an opportunity to answer it in new ways. So, I mean, I think it's, it's really exciting to think about the combination of all of these technologies, of course, uh, because we're not going to do it without AI. We're not going to do it without, um, uh, you know, thinking about long-term sustainability uh, of humanity, a bunch of other stuff. So um, what's going to be different? Well, you asked me about what's going to be different there. And similar, <laughs> you know, as you wish. Like, what do you see just approaching us that you think people may not be aware of in this room that, you know, could either be very, very similar more so than they think or more different than like what, what's Open Luna's work really like day to day on, on solving those issues? Well, I mean, I think that changing the fundamental basis of how we uh, handle appropriation of land and territory gives us this, it's not exactly a blank slate, but it's a template for doing things in different ways. And we will, um, we will in many of the same ways that the, the crypto community and the blockchain community have had to navigate creating new kinds of contracts uh, and new forms of enclosure and agreement and questions of legitimacy, uh, we're going to face all of those. So in, in those senses, it's really similar to many other kind of um, marginal innovation communities uh, that we have on Earth today. Um, some of the differences, of course, are, you know, like um, physically very far away. We're dealing with, you know, a vacuum. We're uh, dealing with all kinds of um, all kinds of differences as well. So, yeah. Okay, lots, lots similar and, uh, and lots different. So I think um, maybe Trent, you could uh, give us your grand lay of the land or of, of outer space of like, what is your vision on, basically you, you, you wrote this fantastic piece on uh, starships and tokens, which is basically starting with the inputs of humans, uh, tokens, technologies, um, moving through um, brain computer interfaces, moving through lunar settlement, a bunch of other settlements, and then going all the way out into space. So maybe you could try to tie the two together and into your long-term vision, and then we get back to them. Sure, happy to. Um, so maybe as a starting point, who here has played the video game Civilization? Okay, most of you, great. And you know in Civilization, there's like a technology tree, right? Where you start off with like fire and then the wheel and all that, right? So like... Um, I had a bunch of the technology tree in my head of like how my model of the world of, of the actual world, right? But why not like sit down and really try to write it out of like what impacts what impacts what? And I ended up with about 80 nodes or so. Um, and um, a lot of the answers surprised me, right? Um, so for example, one of my questions was like, how much does um, Mars matter, right? 
um, and uh, and you know where where what's end game, right? Uh, you know, thinking of both things like Isaac Asimov, the, the final question, that sort of thing, right? That's probably end game of end games. Um, but you can work backwards too, like Dyson spheres is probably the end game unless you go final question style. Um, so like if Dyson spheres are over are over here, and this is us now, what's in between, right? And sort of exponentially increasing XLR and style, right? Um, then uh, with, with that, the broad lay of the land is the following: um, that um, along the way, I saw that there's a few key technology pieces, right? Like internet, for example, itself, like uh, TCP/IP, was a big unlock, right? Because it was actually one of these weird communication technologies that didn't get re-centralized, right? It's sort of the fish that got away. And that actually unlocked and spawned a whole set of other technologies, the World Wide Web on top, and then on top of that, everything we've seen in the last 25 years, right? Um, and now there's sort of this new generation Web3 that also brings in value, right? Reddits with wallets, Reddit, subreddits, subreddits with wallets, like Paul said. Um, and that's a big unlock. So there's this whole subgraph um, related to, you know, you have the foundational stuff, you need decentralized storage, you need decentralized compute, you need de decentralized bandwidth, right? The fundam uh, fundamental elements of computing. And once you have that, then you can start having applications on top like we currently have, but then other applications we've never dreamed of before. Um, but as we go along, you know, there's this parallel thread of AI getting better and better and better. And sort of this, there's this backbone, by the way, all the way along called Moore's Law, right? And Moore's Law is this sort of like, it has this Midas touch, right? Anything that it touches hits an exponential. It, it started happening with um, gene sequencing uh, with the Craig Venter era and so on. And as soon as it happened, suddenly gene sequencing hit this much steeper exponential curve, right? And now it's starting to hit other pieces of, of biology, longevity, longevity, all of that, right? So Moore's Law, at the heart of it, it's, you know, every 18 months, traditionally every 18 months, um, transistors have gotten uh, half as big, right? They take up half as much area. And that has led to chips, you know, like your phone can hold a whole bunch of movies at once and a whole bunch of other stuff that we take for granted. But those phones you hold in your hand, you know, this was, you know, the realm of Star Trek just 25 years ago. And now we just take it for granted. And to our kids, you know, if you have a magazine, that's like a broken tablet, right? Um, to quote some, someone else. But um, so overall, back to this technology tree, um, there's all these key steps along the way, and the blog post lays it out, but a few key ones to, to synthesize, start to synthesize. Um, uh, the problem of AI taking all our jobs, um, the, the answer is um, hijack AI, um, all the wealth created from AI, and feed that back to humanity, right? And that's via these public utility networks, um, self-driving car networks, et cetera. The problem of, um, and you do that you know, via UBI, et cetera, so that's a big unlock, and as soon as you have UBI, it actually um, catalyzes humanity. Way more people can chase their dreams. Way more people can, you know, go to university or paint pictures or write the great novel or play video games in their mother's basement if that's their their goal, right? Like, you know, you don't um, uh, for force people can do whatever that way. But then at the same time, you know, what about the the challenge of um, you know AI is taking over, taking control of the world? And kind of my view is like Moore's law isn't stopping. There's you know there's lots of talks about that, but it's just an economic thing, and the physics is there to go decades more. Um, and I spent a lot of time in that industry, right? So I see that, you know, AIs are going to wake up, right? There's all these theories that, you know, to do the next generation of AI, for AIs to wake up, we need X or Y, some fancy new algorithm. In the end, we didn't. We only just needed more and more slot. We just needed more compute and more storage, et cetera. And this happened time and time again, um, including with all the deep learning stuff, right? You can actually take the same architecture from 1989 and get the same results if you apply computing, enough computing, right? So, so with this, um, on the BCI, if you, here's the thing. If you don't want AI to take control, you know that it's going to get smarter than us. So what do you do? If you can't beat them, join them. And that's where BCI comes in, really. That's kind of how I see the world. And there's a path where you can basically say, you know, iPhone 10 or iPhone 12 is the phone in my pocket that I interface with just audio and text and video. But iPhone 15 has some BCI. And iPhone 16 has a bit more BCI and more and more. And the bandwidth keeps going up and up and up. By the, so by the time you're at iPhone 25 or 35, then... Um, You've got super high bandwidth where the market is demanding this trillion dollar market is saying. And it works on the moon. Yeah, exactly. So, so that, and, and then actually like, you know, and you hedge your bets with, with um, cryogenics, you freeze yourself, right? And you hedge your bets with biology. You, you extend that out because it's, it'll probably take a long time for his civilization to get there, but we're not relying on brain scanning technology getting perfect tomorrow. Instead, you know, we're having 10% of our compute happening um, off of brain and then 20%, then 50, then 99%, then 1,000%, then 10,000%. And eventually, you know, when um, eventually this meat bag part of your, your body, uh, your consciousness is going to be 0.001% overall. And it'll be this toenail that you just clip off because it's slowing you down. And right? Patrushka Bread's next. <laughs>
Yeah, so so then, and basically then, okay. like... Wrap it up. Almost there, yeah, I'll wrap it up. So, Dyson Spheres, right? So, if you think about it, after Mars... Right, yeah, right, guys, yeah. right. But no, like, after Mars, right? Like, Mars is close, right? The moon is extra close. But after Mars, you know, there's not a lot of other interesting planets nearby for humanity. And if I get it right, if I recall correctly, Alpha Centauri is 40,000 light years away. That's like a generation L starship for a long time. And of course, you'll freeze yourself um, to go back and forth. But if you, if you go back, if you, if you explore the Earth, I mean, if you explore the cosmos long enough, you're going to run into the heat death of the universe. And hopefully, we'll have new physics for that. But um, the problem, like, it's a problem. So we don't want to be primates flying around in tin cans, to paraphrase Charlie Strauss, right? So, like, upload, man, like, brain computer, bandwidth plus plus. So that's kind of what I see as tying it all together, right? So we can actually. I want to explore the cosmos, and I don't want to be a primate in a tin can doing so because I just my body won't last at all, right? Um, and I want to build those Dyson spheres. And I'll, I'll summarize with that, right? So there's basically this dig, this map, and I'm saying the crazy stuff because I think it's fun. But I, I, to pull it down to reality, there's near-term challenges of today, right? And those near-term challenges of today, uh, we can address by building the technologies of the today, but you know, building to the next thing and. The moon is a really great step to just loop, loop that in too, right? Because we can experiment with a lot of things. And Mars is still a good idea. But understanding that after Mars, we probably won't be primates exploring or, you know, flying to Alpha Centauri. I'll stop there. Great. Nice synthesis. Okay. Now, you may react to that. Uh, and alternatively, or in addition to that, you may tell us what is the next step in brain-computer interfaces. Like, what can people look forward to in the next, you know, five to ten years to, like, you know, get onto that ramp. We can start with that. Oh, yeah. Also, if anyone has a question, already think about that, uh, because I'll be coming around with the mic in just a second. So the next step is really that we get a, a high bandwidth uh, to the brain and getting chronic data out of the brain and with this more data and getting more data into the brain, so better reading and writing capabilities. And with that, we will see an explosion of the technology as we saw with an explosion of data um, of AI. And there are multiple things I agree. And I believe that brain-computer interfaces are this one technology that is changing everything. Because every innovation step we have done so far, we have done it and it's been driven by our brain. And when we can improve this tool, and make it better, then this will increase the chance of everything. And it will also increase the chance that we somehow can protect us from AI. But I still believe as kind of AI will grow exponentially and we still have some limits in our brain just by size, even if we can merge perfectly, we are just such a small factor that it doesn't matter. But it would be worth kind of now trying to save us kind of and look forward to develop AI safe with the help of BCI, kind of to give us a better chance uh, towards that. Uh, and I'm also agree with you, I also want to have Dyson Pierce. Great, I asked for the next five to 10 years, so you have a very short AI timeline, <laughs> great. <laughs> um, okay, Jesse, can you tell us a little bit about like what are um, kind of upcoming challenges that we'll have to face in uh, lunar governance or lunar settlement or really the first like in Dungeons, like walk us like through the step of like what will you know the next five to ten years bring there? Like what are cur companies currently doing, and what do we have to look forward to, and how can that maybe help us avoiding longer term conflicts down the line as we'll go all the way? Yeah, so I, m I mentioned earlier that there are a number of private companies that are going to the moon. I think there's um, there are I think you know five or so credible, uh, many more non credible um, private companies in similar number of countries uh, planning to go to the moon. Um, one thing that, I mean, as we begin to look at sustained human presence in outer space, one of the things that actually we really haven't um, addressed, which which um, your comments made me think of, are uh, reproduction. We haven't taken um, uh, like mammalian reproduction through a full cycle in outer space ever. We've had pregnancies, uh, like rat pregnancies in outer space. Uh, I believe they were delivered on Earth. Um, that's not exactly the nearest term, but I think it's su super relevant when we think about whether or not we're going to need to uh, find some alternative technology to solve our sustained presence there or not. Uh, in, the, in the shorter term, um, you know, natural resources, I think, are at the core of how we organize ourselves internationally today, the, the state system, uh, primitive accumulation, uh, colonization, debates about 
rights and um, distributive justice. And so the opportunity to kind of reprogram how we think about these things from scratch, if you will, is, is monumental. And so many of these grand technologies that we're working on uh, also, uh, all of us have our kind of like the one, the one trend to rule them all thing. So, you know, here's mine, which is that all of these technologies need governance and our governance is failing us today. And we're seeing that socially and we're seeing that technically or we're seeing that in the social domain and we're seeing that for our technologies. Uh, and so the, the sort of forcing function to try out new, new, new governance approaches, uh, I think, uh, like marries really beautifully with, um, with the opportunity to go to space more concretely. Um, since you asked, I wrote down a few like very specific um, kind of near term problem slash opportunities that can motivate us thinking through new solutions. Uh, one is going to be orbital, like cis lunar orbital and frequency utilization. There is no currently no management. Sorry, it's loud out there. Uh, there's no management approach for uh, how we're going to use lunar orbits. And there are very few stable orbits around the moon. There's no equivalent to geostationary orbit around the moon. Um, and, and our kind of like the ITU doesn't extend um, their reach out to the moon yet. Um, how we'll deal with disposal. There's a, these early uh, lunar missions are gonna be going to, the, going to the moon with a sort of like two, two Earth week lifespan. Uh, and after that, they're just gonna be hunks of metal that are like trash sitting on the lunar surface. A bunch of them are gonna have um, instruments or, or payloads that themselves just become again trash. So thinking about disposal and salvage is also an opportunity to say, well, rather than littering on the moon, maybe when your spacecraft goes, we have a standard that means that uh, I understand that you're going to reuse, you know, like a spent fuel tank that I have on my on my uh, lander. Obviously, mining rights uh, we've talked about, uh, heritage and conservation. Do we preserve old landing sites? What does it mean to have conservation and heritage when you don't have a notion of like a particular state again that is um, stewarding that um, dust? Uh, dust management, because there's uh, no atmosphere when you land on the lunar surface, dust can get lofted up. And in some cases, it can go all the way around the, cir the, um, the circumference of the moon and affect other missions that are happening on the lunar surface. And so how we coordinate on that uh, could involve things like landing pads uh, and coordinating access to shared infrastructure. People have been talking about public goods um, in some of the talks tonight. And I think that's a really interesting opportunity. Um, uh, and finally, a point that my colleague who just left uh, made earlier as we were talking about this is just that because the number of actors now, it's bi it's bigger than it has been in the past and it's relatively diverse, but it's still small. You know, it's like we're talking about order of small, small tens of potential actors. And so to coordinate now, to figure out coordination now is is like a massive opportunity with a high ROI to have to set positive precedents for the future uh, where we won't have that opportunity um, for very long no shortage of challenges and we're dealing with many of them so well on earth what could possibly go wrong all right i will go around again with the microphone and i will give you this one um and again as i move to you please maybe say your name and um i'll start in the back this time hey ho um i'm oliver and i'm just a concerned citizen of the world about uh, what happens to the moon if there's like tons of mining operations happening. So I'm not even sure if this is a realistic question, but what happens if like the moon has such a, like how, how much mass does the moon have compared to the earth? Like one sixth? That's the gravity. Yeah, so, so what happens, like how much, how much mining operation need to happen in order for the moon to have a destabilized orbit or any change in orbit so that it actually can have devastating effects on what happens on earth? I don't have a, a number for you, but quite a lot. I, I, we're, we're, not, we're not in danger of that um, as far as any concepts that are hmm? anytime soon, indeed. Yeah. My grandpa bought me a piece of the moon. So kind of on the map, is it worth and do I have a chance to get very rich with that? I, um, I have a lot of uh, people ask me about this. Um, <laughs> you're, you're, you're welcome to do it as a sort of gimmick, um, but, uh, and apologies to those who've heard this a thousand times, but um, because there's the, the basic legal framework for outer space prohibits um, national appropriation, um, which means that essentially, that, as I was saying earlier, there is no basis yet for uh, owning what we call real property. Uh, in outer space, and so I think um, you know there may be some uh, entertainment value to your to your slip of paper. Well, okay. 
Hi, I'm Aaron. Uh, another question for the uh, brain computer interfaces. So today, social media gave everyone a megaphone, so I can go t on the internet and watch more cat videos than I would ever be able to digest in my lifetime. So um, is there a problem when like everyone can broadcast their complete brain or whatever is going on uh, that basically the information sphere will be so polluted that we don't get anything done? Or if you have like any thoughts on that. We need a good spam filter. I, 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 yeah, definitely. It's a good answer. It's, um, you, you will uh, face the same problems what you face today in the internet, what you face with your smartphone, and some of them uh, will be on steroids. Still, we have an exponential growth of information in this world, and we're not having an exponential capability. No, we have a very flat capability of handling information in this world. What turns to all these sometimes funny, sometimes very, very bad side effects in this world of kind of um, people believing in very weird stuff. Um, and all these theories that are running around. And now what I try to think about, what kind of world do I want to live in, in where people can better handle more information and have more information. And for me, it's also information is step one. It's step one to education and education is a step to wisdom and it's not that we're uploading wisdom into the brain but we at least could make it easier that people have more time kind of to train and to interact with each other and understand and also better verify information way faster because still it's hard you have to pick out your phone and look it up and use your thumb i, I mean it's stupid we know that um in the depth of our heart so um there are these problems and probably you like it to see very much a lot of cat pictures. I can refer on this too. So basically not your keys, not your brain data, right? So decentra um, a pitch ocean for five seconds, decentralized access control, right? Um, and it can, you can use it to mediate your brain data as well. And I'm very excited about, you know, ocean helping to play a role there. I think it's really important. Much better than, you know, like, you know, AWS basically seeing all my data and saying, trust me you know, when it's literally your thoughts. So, um, you know, uh, but instead, bank grade security, right? And lo and behold, you also have a brain wallet built in, so. And, and finally, Dyson Spheres. All right. Maybe, um, to wrap it up on an actional note, if people are inspired, if people are excited about this, uh, how can they find more about you, about your work, about next steps that you're taking? Uh, yeah, what's a good way to contact you? And, you know, what's a good way to plug in? What will be useful for you guys? So um, to learn more about what I said, so instead of the two minute, mile a minute, um, go to Trent Street, so trent.st, and all my blog posts are linked from there as well as my talks, et cetera. And if there's one talk to start with, uh, it's Starships and Tokens. Um, and that's the, the map, the top level thing, and then it drills in. The major subgraph is Nature 2.0, and then there's major subgraphs of that. So that's stuff. Um, and the BCI part is something called uh, the bandwidth plus plus scenario, if you Google that. Um, and then actionable, basically, um, don't give your private data to Facebook and Google and LinkedIn. Think, think more about that, or when you do, I guess. At the, that's the baseline, right? That's all. Just think about it, right? And over time, search for alternatives. That's all. Like, you know, Signal, not WhatsApp, et cetera. Maybe I'll stick with that. Signal 1, not WhatsApp. Thank you. If you still are willing to give your data to LinkedIn, you can find me there. Uh, I really would love to learn more about um, all of you. Um, if you think you have th some overlap with us so that you can help us contribute, um, you think you uh, could um, get something out of that, please feel free to reach out. We are besides our website is very limited um, because of reasons, but uh, we are very open and very happy kind of with um, kind of to connect with you and I would be very pleasant kind of to connect with you um, on LinkedIn. Peter Schlecht, very easy. Uh, well, I work with uh, an organization called the Open Lunar Foundation. Uh, that's openlunar.org. And we're working both on policy, policy work, so sort of like a think tank, uh, but also on institutional prototypes. 
uh, that relate both to natural resource management. Um, we're looking at communications, um, small payloads, et cetera. Um, so you can follow our work on our website, Twitter, all the social media things. Uh, we have a fellowship program. Uh, we're sort of like, I feel very, um, we're like siblings with Foresight. You know, we're, we're small, but uh, we like to think mighty. And um, we have a great community uh, around the organization. Um, so feel free to check us out. Um, the other thing I would say is, broadly speaking, you know, follow, follow where whatever you know country or companies you're involved with um, as relevant. Think about w what kind of stance are they taking on things like uh, space resources. Um, certain larger companies are establishing domestic policies on this, uh, but there's not a huge amount of conversation that's happening. Uh, and, and I think that's partially because people don't know that um, these topics are beginning to be discussed both at the national level, but also at the United Nations level. Um, and the United Nations just uh, formally adopted um, a new working group uh, looking at uh, potential governance models for space resources. Uh, so talking to like finding ways to access your um, whatever country you're from uh, or countries, uh, your kind of like domestic policymakers and showing them that you care about these things. Uh, and if you want some talking points for that, then uh, come talk to us. Wow, great. Okay, lots of things to follow up with. Um, then I guess uh, we will now move into another break um, uh, or like breakout as, 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 as you'd like to say it. I just want to say an official bye, I guess, from Foresight. Thank you so much for having made this so smooth and so special. Uh, we really appreciate it. We hope it's not been the last event in Europe. In fact, it isn't. We are having our member gathering in uh, a castle in France, Chateau de Fay, which many of you have been to already. Uh, on December 4 and 5 in parallel to in San Francisco at the same time uh, in a rocket company, <laughs> of course, a, a ship and uh, the Internet Archive. So if you're interested in that, that's on our website uh, and that's available now. You can also apply to join our virtual groups in which we have these discussions a little bit more structured uh, or you can apply to become a fellow there. And if you do anything, then at least sign up to our mailing list in case this uh, was of any interest to you. I cannot uh, stop uh, tonight's event uh, without having thanked Uh, Joe, Anna, uh, Beatrice, Lou, and all the fantastic people who have helped put this on. In particular, tomorrow by Stasis again for sponsoring us, Gnosis again for sponsoring us, and particularly Silky and fantastic Full No team for um, yeah for bearing with us in this fantastic way. You've been really, 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 really freaking helpful. Thank you so so much. And I hope it wasn't the last time that we see you guys around. We are hoping that we start in San Francisco, then descended upon cyberspace, and are slowly trickling down in different continents. And ultimately, Fossa will become a traveling circus and uh, hopefully with all of you guys. So thanks a lot for joining. It was very, very fun. And have a lovely night.